and, and members of the board. Departmental item number one is from the County Executive Office. It is a hearing to consider recommendations regarding an update on the coronavirus disease 2019 COVID-19. Good morning, Chair Hartman and members of the board. May I have my slides, Madam Clerk? Next. With me this morning is Dr. Henning Ansorg, our county health officer. Our briefing this morning includes a recap on COVID-19 data, uh, some update on the booster shot, update on Delta variant, and we'd like to end with some comments from two local hospital providers. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to pause and appreciate our partners in the healthcare system. We are so fortunate here in Santa Barbara County to have so many accomplished professionals in our broader medical community, joining hands with the public health team in responding to COVID-19. These accomplished individuals in public health and the, and the healthcare community are trained professionals who are committed to protecting the health of our community. They are dedicated to preventing further impacts and pain caused by this pandemic, and they are using their expertise and skills to save lives. A huge thank you from, from me and the Public Health Department. Next. Next. This is a uh, chart displaying uh, case rates by vaccination status as of August 6. Our daily case rate on August 6 was 15.8 per 100,000. However, when we drill down, we see that the rate is 25.4 per 100,000 among unvaccinated individuals and a low of 6.9 per 100,000 among vaccinated individuals. So the takeaway is that our cases were nearly 3.7 times more likely to be unvaccinated than vaccinated. So this is a call to uh, for vaccination. Next. This chart presents presents the seven day rolling sum of new cases by area. And it is an effective way to represent the COVID-19 in geographic area without the noise generated by the high variability in daily case counts. So um, as of August 12th, we continue to see four areas with increasing uh, cases uh, and, and these are higher uh, cases than the rest of the county. So the top is the gray line representing Santa Maria at 200 cases. Uh, the orange line representing Santa Barbara at 125. Next is the yellow line representing Lompoc at 119. And the blue line is uh, represents Orchid at 92 and the rest of the areas are, are lower uh, in new cases. And I'd like to pause here and remind your board that um, this data is available on our website. And this is where I, I heard earlier comments, uh, misquotes of death rates of, of cases, and just wanting to ground everyone that, um, that the, uh, for real data, for vetted data, please refer to the cases and the reports on our website. Next. This is a snapshot of Santa Barbara County by the numbers. Uh, yesterday, we reported uh, 71 new cases. And so this is a slight decrease from our two week average of 104. 
Uh, we did not report any new deaths yesterday. Uh, we have 800 active cases in our uh, county right now with 56 hospitalized. And of the 56 hospitalized, 12 are in the ICU. Uh, we have a uh, total case count of 37,454 um, and a total death count uh, of 470. Our case rate per 100,000 as of August 12th is 23.3. Our testing positivity as of August 12th is 8.7. Next. These are two charts uh, describing our hospital capacity as of August the 16th. So as our cases increase, we worry about the capacity of our local uh, hospital system uh, to care not only for our, uh, the COVID-19 patients, but for patients with other critical medical needs as well. Currently, we have 64.5% of the hospital beds in use, which means that we are at the cusp of being in the red zone which is when we have less than 35% bed capacity. The other graph describes our staffed ICU beds in use. Currently, we have 77.6 of our staffed ICU beds in use. So for this metric, we are also at the cusp of being in the red zone, which is when we have less than 20% available. So we are um, worried about um, this trend and are keeping our eyes um, on our hospital capacity. Next. With regards to uh, COVID-19 hospitalization, so this is data from May and June. Uh, from the available data for May and June, we had 54 hospitalized patients due to COVID-19. Of this number, 89% were vaccinated. Were, I'm sorry, 89% uh, percent were unvaccinated and 11% were vaccinated. With regards to the six hospitalized patients who were vaccinated, these individuals may have been admitted due to comorbidities or other medical needs. And we are going to be looking um, into the, the percent of vaccinated hospitalized uh, patients. And Dr. Fitzgibbons will uh, have a more updated uh, number of hospitalization for Cottage Hospital. And we anticipate uh, within a few weeks to uh, update countywide the uh, July uh, hospitalizations. Next. As of yesterday, we have 63.3% of our eligible Santa Barbara County as fully vaccinated. And again, here is um, the bottom line. The bottom line is that there are still 142,006 individuals who are eligible to be vaccinated but have yet um, uh, taken the opportunity. Next. Um, outbreaks. Uh, this is uh, something we are seeing an uptick in outbreaks uh, reflective in the cases that I uh, showed you earlier. Currently, we have 33 active outbreaks throughout our county. Uh, public health is monitoring uh, each of these cases, um, situations to mitigate further spread of COVID-19. And these outbreaks are occurring in a wide array of businesses, congregate settings, as well as education. Next. Next. As you may have heard, the FDA recently approved uh, the booster shot for immunocompromised individuals. Uh, booster is available as a third shot for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines only. We, uh, California 
is estimated to have 700 eligibles for the third shot. Here in Santa Barbara County, we are estimating roughly about 13,500 individuals um, as eligible for the booster shot. Uh, current vaccine providers and the pharmacies uh, that are existing uh, are sufficient to deliver uh, the booster shot. The uh, booster shot will require self-attestation by individuals. So individuals will need to self-attest that they are receiving active cancer treatment for tumors or cancers of the blood. They are attesting to receiving an organ transplant and taking medicine to suppress their immune system, or that they have received stem cell transplant within the last two years, or taking medicine to suppress their immune system, or have moderate or severe primary immunodeficiency, or have advanced or untreated HIV infection, or um, have active treatment with high dose corticosteroids or other drugs that suppress um, their immune response. And we are working with our provider community um, uh, with regards to the process um, and we'll be updating our provider community as we hear updates from the state. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce to your board um, Dr. Ansorg, who will be presenting the next few slides on the Delta variant. Thank you, Dr. Lorenoso. Good morning, Chair Hartman and members of the board. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Everybody has heard about the Delta variant. It's a um, um, combination of several mutations that originated somewhere in um, India um, earlier this year, and it made its way to Europe and to the United States. It um, has a shorter incubation period than the previous form of the virus, which um, means that it starts to infect people faster. And unfortunately, even vaccinated persons can get infected by the Delta variant, uh, mainly because it attacks the local immune system so rapidly that the antibodies are basically outpaced and um, they can only start clearing the virus once the antibody response is really um, ramping up in the system. Um, the virus may be um, um, shed it a little bit longer, um, and uh, mainly in the unvaccinated. Um, vaccinated people seem to clear the virus within five, after about five days. Um, even if they get infected. Um, we have also seen that uh, the Delta virus seems to have much higher viral loads, which means there's more virus, uh, viable virus in um, infected person. And we can measure it by CT values on the PCR tests. Next slide, please. In May, uh, on May 1st, actually, we saw the first two cases in Santa Barbara County with the Delta variant. Those were travelers from India, and both of whom had been vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine in their home country. Um, they became symptomatic shortly after arrival in Sacramento and um, were tested and found to be positive. They did not require hospitalization and they isolated immediately and no further contacts um, were infected, fortunately. In June, um, our um, sequencing testing with UCSB and the state showed that we had over 50% of the samples that were sequenced during June um, were already Delta. At that time, the old UK variant, now called Alpha, was already receding, and we had very rare gamma and no more Western coast or California type viruses at that time. As of July, uh, we tested um, a lot of samples for variants and Delta made up 
way more than 95% of every single sequence sample in Santa Barbara County. This is consistent with um, the state and it is consistent uh, with uh, national trends. Um, unfortunately, we did now start to see breakthrough cases. They were no longer rare, but more common. Next slide. This is a picture of Provincetown around July 4th, where a lot of uh, festivities took place. And uh, it was a, um, an outbreak was reported that got everybody's attention um, because the, um, this outbreak for the first time showed the effectiveness of the Delta variant on even vaccinated people. Initially, 469 people were identified, and uh, um, three quarters of those in the beginning were actually vaccinated folks. Um, now, there's a lot of limitations to this study. However, it gave us very good information on what to look out for with Delta and how infectious it is. Next slide, please. So uh, a few um, data on, on the epidemiology of this Delta uh, variant. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the virus gets spread for a longer period of time and more people get infected. Um, the term that we use um, in medicine and epidemiology to confer the um, contagiousness of a virus is, um, are, are not, and um, when the are not number is one, it means that one infected person um, infects one other person. Now, our previous um, type of the COVID virus had an R not of two to three, which means one infected person infected two or three other people. This new Delta variant now is um, much more contagious for various reasons. And the R uh, naught is uh, believed to be anywhere between six and seven. So my slide is already incorrect. Um, we are considering it around seven. That means one infected person can infect seven others on average. Now, um, for comparison, the regular flu virus has an R naught anywhere between one and two, which means one person with influenza infects one or two other people. And chickenpox has anywhere between eight and, and 10. And th this means that, that this Delta variant is really approaching contagiousness of chickenpox, which is very significant and concerning. Um, fortunately, the vaccine are still very effective at keeping people alive and also um, um, keeping people out of the hospital for the most part. Dr. Fitzgibbons will talk a little bit more about that. Um, we are seeing less severe cases. Um, many vaccinated people have more milder symptoms when they indeed get infected. And they fortunately um, clear the virus faster than unvaccinated people. Next slide, please. In the beginning, we said that we were very hopeful um, to um, anticipate a rapid drop of our current surge. And we um, related that, I mean, our hope was grounded in the findings in England. Uh, they had a very significant surge, as you can see the, the, uh, to the right on the, on the uh, graph here. Uh, they, they saw this huge surge in um, starting in early July. And at some point, around mid of July, there was a rapid decline. Um, it is unfortunate to see that subsequently uh, this decline plateaued and actually is on the up uh, swing again. So um, please understand that um, the, the Delta variant is very, very new and we are grappling uh, to get um, new information. So whatever has been published last week um, is already um, probably outdated. And we have to constantly accommodate uh, for that and come out with new information. So um, there, there are modeling, uh, there are models out there that um, predict 
or foresee that we may only see our peak of this current outbreak in October. Um, so I wanted to share this that um, we can no longer uh, really rely on the findings uh, from England. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So we, we, we are very grateful to have Dr. Chuck Merriff, uh, emergency room physician from Marion Hospital, and Dr. Lynn Fitzgibbons, an infectious disease physician at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital, and uh, they will give us some more information from their perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ensorg. Um, I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Marion. I'd like to start off by thanking all of the people, the community service people that were acknowledged earlier in this meeting. As we all know, healthcare goes way beyond the, the walls of our hospitals. And, and thank you from, from our hospital and my point of view for all of, all of the service that, that everyone has done. Thank you. Um, I will say that at Marion, our, our numbers uh, support the numbers that Dr. Durinoso showed. Uh, we've, uh, as of yesterday, had 44 patients in our hospital as inpatients, uh, 13 of which were in our intensive care unit. So we are seeing uh, a lot of disease and severity of disease as well. Uh, and I think her graphs also show that we've seen more uh, in the North County than we have in the South County. What we would like to promote, uh, too, to prevent this spread, which Dr. Ansor uh, eloquently stated uh, is much more contagious than the previous variants, uh, is to promote not only vaccinations, which clearly make the disease uh, more tolerable, uh, but also the use of masking. Uh, and we, I'm in my office alone, so I'm not masked, but indoors, uh, where the virus is clearly more transmissible, uh, we really want to promote uh, masking for people. We, uh, we in our hospitals are masked everywhere in the hospital, with the exception of you by yourself. Uh, and, and so I would really like to promote uh, to everyone listening, the use of masks, which is a way to protect not only yourself, but those around you. Thank you very much. Dr. Merrill, um, and uh, thank you to the board. Thank you to the CEO's office. Um, but I'll actually just take uh, 10 seconds to duplicate um, Dr. Duranoso's example of starting with a gratitude. I haven't actually had very many opportunities to publicly thank Dr. Duranoso and Dr. Ansorg for all that they have done, but I have had a front seat view of the last year and a half. And um, I know that much of it has been on public display, but much of it has been um, just the, the tireless work behind the scenes. And um, I just, um, I'm very grateful to be able to say that um, our county is in the hands of excellent um, doctors, um, but also fundamentally fantastic people. And so um, thank you to both of them for that. I'd love to go to my first slide then. And touch on the next slide, please. And just mention um, a couple of, uh, a couple of perhaps uh, comments on vaccines, breakthrough cases, and boosters that Dr. Ansorg um, already alluded to. So I think we're all aware that every media cycle we see a new, uh, a new study, a new version um, of data that tells us just how good these vaccines are. And one of the challenges has been that every one of these studies is doing you know, very different work whether they are working in a lab, look, looking at what are called neutralizing antibody levels, um, or looking perhaps in real life results in real people. It, 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 even, even real life results in real people are often comparing apples to oranges, depending on um, what your threshold is for testing, depending on uh, the timing of vaccination rollout in a specific community or country. All this to say, I think uh, we're again very fortunate for our local expertise to be able to really drill down locally and help to answer some of these questions. Locally, of course, we have used the three EUA available vaccines listed here, Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson. But ultimately, as in the weeks ahead, we do continue to see um, new reports on vaccine efficacy or how well the vaccines work, please do remember that these are often um, very difficult to compare with prior studies because there are just so many variable factors to consider. 
So what I focus on, and I think some of you have heard me say this in recent weeks, is I really try to focus on the recurrent themes. And our public health experts, our public health officials have already told us those themes. Those themes, remember, are that our vaccines continue to prevent severe disease, hospitalization, and death. As we said, and I put a period at the end of this sentence to just emphasize that um, this, is, this is true, unfortunately. Vaccine breakthrough cases occur with the Delta variant. We wish that were not the case, but we know it to be the case. The good news is we know, again, that these are not severe cases, hospitalized cases, or deaths for the most part. The main question, I think, uh, for, for many of us right now is understanding if you have a breakthrough case, if you are one of those unlucky ones, everyone remembers Dr. Duranoso showed us you know, just how disproportionately the unvaccinated group is compared to the vaccinated group. But if you're in that unlucky group who do develop a vaccine breakthrough infection, how infectious are you? And as Dr. Ansorg mentioned, perhaps our best data on this, and in fact, the study that we think really informed the national shift in policy on indoor mask usage um, was, of course, what happened in Provincetown with, with the information that the viral load, essentially how much virus an infected person has when we do the swab, we thought previously and hoped previously that people who were vaccinated with a breakthrough infection had lower viral load, because that may mean that they're less infectious. Unfortunately, what happened with that very important MMWR study is that we learned that while it's less likely that a vaccinated person will become infected, if they do become infected, those viral loads are pretty high in both the unvaccinated group and unfortunately that smaller number of vaccinated breakthrough infections. So I think it's important then to think about what does this mean with infectivity? And we actually have some newer data on this quite recently. And I think an important part of the story and how we can reconcile that with the idea that again, vaccinated people with breakthrough infections are likely to be less sick, but also less likely to be infectious. And this data comes out of Singapore. This data is actually, um, it's a pre-publication. And so we'll look forward to hearing um, you know, the, the review and hopefully a full publication to come in the weeks ahead. But what we have learned is that while breakthrough infections have high viral loads, just as unvaccinated infections have high viral loads, how quickly those viral loads drop depends on your vaccine status. And in fact, people who have breakthrough infections with a, after a vaccination, while they might at the beginning have a high viral load, they quite quickly become um, much less infectious with less viral loads. And again, this is an important question. It's a, an important part of, I think, uh, um, a lot of our local public health policy. Um, but I think another for me, as I hear this, yet another reason to continue to reiterate that vaccinations truly are not just a way to prevent severe disease and death, but truly a way to get a handle on this infection, on this surge in our community. And then finally, Dr. Dorinoso mentioned uh, booster vaccines and described, she did more than mention, she, she clearly described the new policy, the national policy, um, because unfortunately we know that protection from these vaccines is not as long lived as we wish. And of course, we now have on uh, last Friday, we have the recommendation from the CDC's ACIP uh, to proceed with uh, booster vaccines for those who've received an mRNA vaccine, Pfizer and Moderna, with a third dose. Um, and uh, Dr. Duranoso carefully went through all of the indication for who qualifies as truly immunocompromised and qualifying for this. We've also heard just in the last 12 or 14 hours um, some indication of perhaps even some national level changes that may be coming in a more global way with regards to booster vaccinations. And um, I know that there is a, a lot of discussion locally and nationally um, about this. And uh, I think we all look forward to hearing more, more about this. Next slide. I'd like to then just for my last two slides so sh show some very specific data from Cottage Health. Um, and a thank you to Hannah Hussein, one of our senior analysts um, who follows this data incredibly carefully and has provided us with this slide. What we see here is the number of COVID admissions by week from May until last week. And you see the breakdown, the color um, is a function of vaccine status. 
And what you see overwhelmingly, of course, is that the blue color, those who are unvaccinated, really make up the majority of our COVID admissions by week. I'll make a, a very clear point, though, that this data is based on who had a positive COVID test when they were admitted to the hospital. And so what that means is if someone comes in with a fractured hip or perhaps having been in a motor vehicle accident and they're incidentally found to be COVID positive, they're included in this. And what, what does that mean from an infectious disease perspective? It means it's, it's probably slightly slanted um, in the direction of not really showing the true benefit of the vaccines in preventing severe COVID specific hospitalizations. Nevertheless, we still have you know, 80, 80 to 90% of our COVID positive um, admissions to Cottage Health in the last three months have unfortunately been in those who are unvaccinated, the trend that we're seeing regionally and nationally. Next slide. And then I'll just finish up with, um, with, with this slide. Um, some of you may have seen, I shared it last week in a webinar, but we've actually extended it. Thank you to Mr. Brett Tandy, um, our CFO at Cottage, who um, has worked on this and provided me with um, yet another update of it. And so if you'll just follow me on, on what this, this graph shows, um, and I think some of you remember, I used to be a high school physics teacher, so forgive, forgive, the, um, the, forgive the graph, but if you follow on the x-axis, the bottom axis there, basically telling us how many recent positive tests we've seen at Cottage through our Pacific Diagnostic Lab, and then on the y-axis, how many admissions we had, you can see every single one of these dots represents a day. The blue dots are days during the winter surge. And so what we saw, and it makes sense, is that as we had more COVID positive tests, as we moved to the right, there were more admissions to Cottage um, in a week. And that, that correlation makes a lot of sense. What's so interesting and what we've been following so closely as we try to make our own predictions for what's ahead for our own hospital resource strains is what's happening with the red dots. The red dots here are showing you the Delta surge. The red dots here are just the past 30 days. And what's so very interesting is while there's clearly still a trend as you know, the number of uh, you know, COVID positive tests we've had in the past week um, rises, so does the, the number of hospitalizations on the y-axis on the left there. But what's interesting is that the line has shifted down. In other words, on any given day, if we had a certain, or any, any given week, if we had a certain number of COVID positive tests, we, during this Delta surge, are seeing less hospitalizations than we would have at an equivalent level of, of new, new cases uh, during the winter surge. So why is this? And there are lots of theories about this, and it's probably a variety of things. It's probably that we are thankfully doing more testing. We're capturing more asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic cases in the community. It's possibly also the case that we have more cases in the community who are thankfully less likely to become severely ill. They have that good vaccine protection, or perhaps they're fundamentally more young and healthy and less likely to need to come into the hospital. And there may well be other factors, um, but I think important for, again, internally our um, predictions ahead with regards to the impact of the Delta surge on the hospitalizations. Um, and also I think important for us to follow as a community. And so I'll go to my last slide and just um, conclude with two final comments. The first is, although we've said it um, several times, but just to reiterate, expanding vaccination in our community is the best protection that we have against what's ahead. Um, grateful to everyone who's worked on this and continues to work on this and really encourage anyone who is unvaccinated to please, please do um, whatever you can to find the information that, can tr that you trust to inform your decision and, and help our whole community and you and your family get better protected. I think secondly, just to reiterate um, the importance of mask use indoors. We know that the Delta virus, as Dr. Answerk pointed out, is really in many ways a, a different type of disease, a different epidemic, a different problem. And we know that when we wear masks, we know that we mitigate or reduce the amount of aerosolization of that virus. Dr. Answerk showed something critically important when he showed us that the, the R naught value has jumped from two to three to six. Just to give context of what that number means, that number, if we have 10 transmissions on with something that has an R naught of two to three compared to an R naught of uh, six or seven, we're talking after 10 cycles through a population, we're talking about a difference between a few thousand cases 
starting with one, one case versus tens of millions of cases. And again, I think just important to really understand that the Delta, the Delta variant is uh, certainly bringing new challenges, um, but I think fundamentally we're ready. I'll hand this back to Dr. Derwinoso, I think. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgibbons, and thank you, Dr. Merrill and Dr. Ansor for joining me on today's briefing. And that concludes um, the briefing from our public health department, and we are available for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Del Reynoso, um, and special thanks to Dr. Merrill and Dr. Fitzgibbons, uh, your trusted voices in our community, and uh, it's, it's great to have you here. Um, Dr. Del Reynoso, will they uh, entertain questions from the board? I believe that both Dr. Fitzgibbons and Dr. Merrill are able to uh, make comments with regards to uh, the boots on the ground from their hospitals, as well as their expertise as uh, medical providers. Great, thank you. Uh, so um, I first see a light from Supervisor Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I wanna express my thanks too to Dr. De Reynoso and Dr. Anzorg and Dr. Fitzgibbons and Dr. Merrill for being here today to help share this really critical information. And they're really representing um, the entire medical community in Santa Barbara County today. They're standing up for the folks who are working um, nonstop for the past 17 months uh, protecting us. And, and those folks don't get enough recognition. They're working diligently 24 seven. And um, one of the really difficult things about the public response to this virus is that what's happening in those hospitals is largely invisible to us. You know, we have this opportunity when these medical professionals join us, you know, to, to get their insight into the work that they're doing and the things that they are seeing, seeing on a daily basis in the hospital. And I think that that has been a real communication challenge for us and everybody in public health is to, to help the regular public understand, you know, what it is like for somebody in the hospital um, trying to treat patients that are, that are struggling to survive um, this really serious illness. There's a lot of, you know, information and, and we've all gotten very tired of, of this pandemic. It's, it's exhausting emotionally, physically for everyone. And yet um, the consequences of it are, are very abstract and dis distracted from us and our lives. So I hope that Dr. Merrill and Dr. Fitzgibbons could put a human face on that and help amplify you know, the message and the urgency of the experiences they have on a daily basis um, working with patients that are in the hospital. Thank you, Supervisor Hart. Supervisor Williams? Well, I, I wanna echo uh, Supervisor Hart's comments uh, and and be a voice of encouragement. And uh, we really appreciate the many hours that all four of you and your staffs are putting into fighting this pandemic. Um, and um, I'm just hoping that they'll both be staying till after public comment, uh, because I think we're still in the midst of trying to convince some folks of the, in the public, um, either that, that vaccination is the right course or to prioritize the time. Um, it's a mix of, of folks. Um, not all are vaccine hesitant, um, uh, but, but I really think that they need to hear from you, uh, especially after some of the public comment we may have recently. Supervisor Nelson. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I just had a question for Dr. Merrill or Dr. Fitzgibbon. And first of all, I wanted to thank both of you for being here. Um, as a resident of the Santa Maria Valley, um, I know Dr. Merrill is uh, thought of in all circles highly and um, all the work you guys are doing at Marion Hospital. You guys um, have a lot to be commended through uh, for throughout this pandemic. And Dr. Fitzgibbons, I've heard nothing but good things about you from um, many of my South uh, Coast colleagues and businesses and um, you know, stakeholders down there um, that are working with College Hospital. So thank you both for being here. Um, a question that I've been trying to find out is, you know, of the unvaccinated um, cases that you have in the hospital, um, are you guys finding any of them below the age of 12 that were not eligible for vaccines? Um, are you, you know, what does that look like? That's because I think that's something helpful for the discussion um, when we're trying to figure out, um, you know, how to move forward with this. So thank you for your comments. Um, we have not seen any pediatric patients at Marion as of yet. Uh, I'll defer to Dr. 
that's given for their experience. Thanks, Dr. Murrow. And thank you, Supervisor uh, Nelson. Your comments are much appreciated. Um, unfortunately, we have had pediatric cases. We've had pediatric cases really throughout the pandemic, including in recent weeks. Um, we've had both adolescents above the age of 12 who would have been vaccine eligible, um, and we've had those below the age of 12. What we have um, really started to discuss is what we are seeing across the country. And what I mean by that is, unfortunately, we are hearing and seeing children's hospitals and hospital wings for pediatrics that are really suffering from an really as yet unseen epidemic of pediatric cases. The good news is that most kids get mild disease. The problem, as I said last week, is a small percentage, a very small percentage of a huge number is a medium-sized number. And so I wanna be very clear, again, to piggyback off perhaps a couple of the other supervisors' comments, we're grateful for this uh, appreciation, but we're exhausted. And um, our staff is working so very hard right now, including um, even today engaging in discussions as to how we are going to care for the potential for an influx of pediatric cases. And, um, Man, I wish that we weren't having to talk about that right now. I'll actually use that to just because, again, just my final comment on this. I warned you I was a high school teacher. I take the mic and I don't give it up. Thank but my final, my final comment on this is oh, just tremendous gratitude to not just Dr. Ansorg and Dr. Duranosa, but their whole team at the public health department that is working so closely with Superintendent Salcedo and all of the superintendents ac across the district to make sure that with school restarting this year, this week, excuse me, and so exciting for, for so many families, so many districts, but just doing whatever we can to avoid the, the bump in cases that we are anxious could be ahead if we, if we don't get it right. Thank you. Thank you, doctors. I have a few other questions for Dr. Anzorg. Um, the, the first one had going back to slide four of the presentation that um, Dr. Um, Bobrinoso had um, about the case rates for vaccinated versus un unvaccinated in the county. And I was wondering if you believed or if it's possible the reason why our case rate is so low in vaccinated um, individuals is, is potentially because a lot of them aren't getting tested because they're, they, they're asymptomatic. So that, that in fact, we actually may have quite a few more um, vaccinated um, people who are who actually have COVID in our community, but are really um, unaware that that's the case. Um, Supervisor Nelson, um, two comments. Um, um, I agree with the assessment that we may undercount um, vaccinated people who would test positive if they were to test. However, um, there are also data, I mean, there are studies out there from out of Scotland and out of Israel that show that the COVID vaccines, especially the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, actually protect um, the vaccinated person from even getting infected to a significant degree, anywhere between 65 to 80%. Now, again, <laughs> those data have been out for like three weeks, so they may change. <laughs> Everything changes so quickly here. But uh, there is definitely evidence that fully vaccinated people get infected less frequently. So, and that, that's what I'm trying to figure out, or at least ask some questions about to kind of tease out. So we're talking about the R-naught, which is a transmissibility frequency. Is there any look at what the transmissibility of for a vaccinated versus unvaccinated individual might be? You know, is it six or seven um, for the unvaccinated, but two or three for the unvaccinated, or is that an average of the two? Um, no, uh, how's that been teased out? Uh, Supervisor Nelson, the, the R-naught uh, relates to the virus, not to the vaccination status. So it is, it is, the, the, it is the ability of the virus to infect people on an epidemiological status. I don't think, to my knowledge, I've never seen anywhere a differentiation between the unknots between vaccinated or unvaccinated people. That's, um, it, it, is, it is a delineation of the contagiousness of the virus. Okay. So it can be just as contagious in a vaccinated versus unvaccinated individual. Correct. That's also why we say, you know, the R not for chickenpox is 10. And uh, many people are vaccinated against chickenpox. So we don't say are not as um, 
10 for unvaccinated and 12 for vaccinated or anything like that. So that is never um, being reported. So the virus is um, much more contagious and um, that's un unfortunate for us, but uh, fortunately the vaccines are still very helpful. That's very helpful for me to understand this. So thank you, Dr. Hanzor. One last question, because you know there's a big conversation going on in our community about the about masks, obviously, and and the efficacy of masks. You know, um, I don't doubt at all the efficacy of masks, especially in like a hospital setting. But are we seeing any type of um, you know is it, it the real life setting, maybe the non medical setting? You know, um, many households that um, you know maybe have a basket of masks sitting there. Are, are we studying that or looking at? Um, you know, because I would imagine at some point masks can actually be counterproductive if um, it's, you know, you have the right, the right type of mask hygiene or, or whatnot. So are we, are we looking at that at all? Is that something that you can comment on? And Dr. Ansar, you're muted. Apologies, I was unmuted, my uh, difficulties. So I think um, mask hygiene was a big issue in the beginning of the pandemic when we were still thinking that the virus would also spread through surfaces. We are much less concerned about that because it's an um, airborne disease now, especially with the Delta variant. So we are less concerned about that. Uh, any mask will help. However, obviously an N95 respirator or a surgical mask um, that is uh, frequently used uh, tight to the cheeks and over the nose is more protective for the wearer. Um, and um, and uh, there's, there's a lot of evidence now that mask, especially indoors, is really a very highly protective measure. And um, it's uh, obviously not as good as a vaccine, but I think it's what we need to do when we have this significant increase in community transmission. We need to sort of try and find um, something that will not um, impact people too much in their daily lives, but has a good effect in preventing the spread of the virus. And um, that's, that's why the indoor masking seemed really important. Thank you. Is that your final question, Supervisor Nelson? Yes, Chair Hartman, thank you very much. Supervisor Hart. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to um, a point that Dr. Fitzgibbons was making about young children and the best things that we can do to protect them. As we go into the school um, openings, and, and it's so important to get kids back in school for all the reasons that we all intuitively understand. But at the same time, all of us have an obligation to do everything we can to protect the children that can't get vaccinated. I mean, that isn't even an option if you're under 12 years old. So all of us assume a larger burden in the community to protect those children as they're going to be gathering in schools. And, you know, the two strategies that we have that are the most effective are vaccinations and um, masking. And I, I just think it's so critical to have um, Dr. Fitzgibbons and Dr. Merrill re-emphasize how important this is for everybody to continue to, uh, to press um, for more people to get vaccinated in any way that, that makes it easy for them, you know, make it accessible, make it convenient, um, make it popular, and have everybody kind of understand that they have a role to play and that the behavior of wearing masks um, indoors around other people is also critical to that, to stopping the spread of an extremely infectious variant. You know, I've, I've heard this narrative that, um, you know, that the, the public health messaging hasn't been consistent through this pandemic. And I think the reason for that is because the challenge hasn't been consistent. You know, circumstances have changed over time. This variant is a different thing than what we were fighting with um, earlier in the year. It's much more infectious, you know, the stakes are higher, and um, we, we have these simple and really effective tools that are available to help everybody um, together um, protect each other. So if Dr. Fitzgibbons or Dr. Merrill want to talk about, you know, that relationship between public health, all of our agency doing the right thing and, and protecting each other, and the ultimate result in protecting children, I'd love to hear their thoughts. I'd like to thank this group for, for having this be a subject uh, of interest and, and letting us participate because I think educating the community is the best thing we can do 
one, one thing that wasn't said about masks uh, is that uh, this is not the only virus out there. And this year, particularly, we didn't see much influenza at all. Uh, and so it also protects people against some of the other pathogens that are out there. I'll give it to you, Lynn, for further. Thanks, Chuck. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, and thanks, uh, Supervisor Hart, for the question. I think um, to be, uh, you know, to be thinking about what can we do to protect children for, you know, these next few weeks ahead, um, I think a couple of thoughts. I think first, we're all well aware that this is not coming and going, and uh, and and you know, it, it's not what we hoped it would be back in April of 2020. This is our children's lives. This is their development. Um, keeping them, you know, thriving, learning in school, um, as I say, butts in seats um, in the classroom is, uh, you know, is, is, is really a top priority, but also doing so safely. And so I think, um, you know, masks, I, I wish my, my kids didn't have to meet their, their teachers this week. Um, wearing a mask inside their classroom, but I'm so grateful that they are because I know that it is uh, going to keep them and everyone in their classroom safer. And um, I know that it's going to keep them learning through September and into October and hopefully, you know, and on and on. I think, uh, you know, when they're outside, I'm thrilled that they are going to run around um, breathing their own air, um, hopefully not sharing air with others, but without a mask on and seeing the smiles of their friends, seeing those new braces go on um, and, uh, you know, and, and enjoying some, some freedom from the masks. But that doesn't take away from how critically important those masks are in keeping our kids safe inside, um, particularly inside their classrooms. So I think uh, that's my perspective on, uh, on masks and kids for, you know, especially this important week ahead. Um, Dr. Fitzgibbons, uh, could you talk a little bit about long COVID and if we know anything about that vis-a-vis -vis children? Thanks. Great, great question. Um, so long COVID for everyone to remember is um, what we think of it as the, the set of symptoms that unfortunately some people are getting after they recover from their acute COVID-19 infection. And again, unfortunately, what we've seen through the pandemic is that a fair number of people, I mean, again, there's a lot of variability in these studies, but a lot of people uh, um, are, are unfortunately developing a range of symptoms. It ranges everywhere from you know, brain fog to um, excessive fatigue to respiratory symptoms and you know, indeed even damage to the lungs in some, in some cases. And so, I just wanted to reiterate what um, I think Supervisor Hart said a minute ago, and Dr. Ansorg has said so many times, the Delta surge is really its own pandemic. It's, it's behaving differently than everything before. And also to, to kind of uh, echo the important point that was made, which is that I am grateful our public health officials locally and nationally have not stuck their heels in on any one policy that they decided a year ago, but rather have moved as we have learned more. This pandemic has been dynamic. And so too would we hope and expect our public health recommendations to also be dynamic and to adjust in a way that keeps us as safe as we can, uh, as we can be um, as information changes. And so all this to say with long COVID and the Delta variant, I have to tell you honestly, we don't know. We don't have any reason to believe that the percent of people that develop long COVID after Delta should be different than after the prior variants. But I'll be able to tell you that in November, December, once I've seen again, unfortunately, a lot of people suffer from this current surge and then see how they do. Then when we think about children, again, unfortunately, we do know that a very small percentage of kids do develop long COVID. Our local pediatricians have been dealing with this for over a year now. If you talk to any of them, they're seeing patients who had COVID and then are you know, still struggling with fatigue or with some of these other symptoms, maybe difficulty concentrating in school. And so I think the, the point is, um, and the question is, is much appreciated and I look forward to learning more. I certainly hope that we continue to see very, you know, low percentage of, of long COVID in pediatrics, but I worry that with this uh, potentially big surge of, you know, of cases in kids that we may be facing, I do worry again that even a very, very small percentage of a big number um, could be some kids who are suffering from long COVID down the road. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgibbons. Um, I think with that, uh, I don't see any more board members with questions. 
um, although if I, I know you're very busy, um, but Supervisor Williams mentioned if you could stay and, and respond to some of the public comment, if you would like to, you would certainly welcome that. So turning to public comment, 